Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the webinar. We're here today with Natalie Wexler, education writer and senior contributor at Forbes.com. She is the author of The Knowledge Gap, The Hidden Cause of America's Broken Education System and How to Fix It, and also the co-author of The Writing Revolution, A Guide to Advancing Thinking Through Writing in All Subjects and Grades. Her articles and essays on education and other topics have appeared in The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Atlantic, and other publications. She has spoken on education before a wide variety of groups and appeared on a number of TV and radio shows, including Morning Joe and NPR's On Point and 1A. She lives in Washington, D.C. with her husband and has two adult children. Before we get started, I just want to remind you that this is being recorded and will be sent to all registrants afterwards. Please submit any questions you have in the Q&A box in your toolbar along the bottom of your screen. And if we have time, we'll get to them at the end. Closed captioning is available by clicking on live transcript in your toolbar. With that, Natalie, please take it away. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Laura. And I am going to try to, I have a lot to cover, but I'm gonna to try to leave time for questions at the end. So I will plunge right in. Um, so middle schoolers and writing for engagement. Um, so how can writing engage middle schoolers while also boosting reading comprehension and analytical ability? Well, there are a lot of potential benefits of writing. So um, I'm gonna tell you about those and some obstacles to achieving those benefits. So today we're gonna talk about why standard approaches to writing instruction haven't exploited its potential why it's important to begin writing at the sentence level if that's what students need, regardless of their grade level, and why it's important to ground writing activities in a curriculum that is rich in content. And I'm also going to show you some examples of effective writing activities that teach writing skills and build all important academic knowledge and vocabulary at the same time. So why is writing, first put the potential benefits of writing. Let's go into those a little bit more clearly. So writing can familiarize students with the conventions of written language, boosting reading comprehension. It's important to bear in mind that written language is almost always more complex than spoken language. And if students are going to ultimately read and understand written language, they need to become familiar with that more complex syntax, subordinate, subordinate conjunctions and complex sentences and the passive voice and vocabulary like moreover and despite. And if students learn to use those things in their writing, they're in a much better position to understand them when they come across them in their reading. Second, writing can develop analytical abilities. When you write, you're connecting different pieces of information. You're deciding what's really important, what else is connected to that. Writing can also build and deepen knowledge, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. And it's actually so powerful that it can compensate for even significant gaps in background knowledge. So why do I say writing is potentially so powerful? Um, well, it has to do with how our memory works. Um, and as you can see from this diagram, there's a lot of things we just forget. So the first box there, sensory memory, we don't have to worry about that too much. Basically, if you don't pay attention to something, you're not gonna remember it, okay. But then working memory, that's crucial. It's crucial for understanding learning in general. Working memory is that consciousness where we're taking in new information and trying to make sense of it. And the important thing to know about working memory is that it can easily get overwhelmed if you try to juggle too many things. The best estimates are that you can juggle maybe four to seven items uh, for no more than 20 seconds. I've seen estimates like 10 seconds. So things can easily get forgotten if they're if you're trying to juggle things too much in working memory. You don't have the capacity while you're juggling all those things to really think about what you're trying to make sense of and to absorb and retain that information. 
So the way to get around that problem is to have information in long-term memory, which is potentially infinite. But you have to get those things transferred from working memory to long-term memory. And how do you do that? Well, basically by really thinking deeply about them, talking about those things, explaining them to somebody else, teaching or writing about those things. That's a very powerful way to get things into long-term memory. But then you have to get them out of long-term memory when you need them. That's the retrieval part. And writing is also very powerful in helping to practice that kind of retrieval, to make things easier to retrieve from long-term memory when you need them. So here's a, a graph taken from an experiment that was done about 10 years ago on um, retrieval practice and comparing it with other learning methods. Um, so this experiment took a bunch of college students actually and asked them to read an article about sea otters and then told them to do different things to study it. Uh, one group was told to study it once, one group was told to study it twice and maybe they highlighted some important things. Another group was told to do concept mapping and then this group on the far right engaged in what's called retrieval practice. So what did that consist of? That consisted of writing about the passage they had read. Uh, they read it through once, they were asked to write about it for five to 10 minutes, then they read it again, they wrote about it again for five to 10 minutes, and then their recall of the information was tested a week later. And as you can see, the ones who wrote about it, who engaged in that kind of retrieval practice, remembered a lot more than the others. So writing is so powerful because it helps both with transferring information into long-term memory and getting it back out of long-term memory when you need it in working memory. But most students aren't getting these benefits from writing and they're not learning to write well either. So these are the results from the most recent uh, writing NAEP writing test, the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Every, well, every two years they test kids in reading and math. Every once in a while, they test them in other things. Um, unfortunately, they, they haven't released any more recent res writing results than this, but there's no reason to believe things have really improved. And what we see here is that only about 20, about a quarter of students test proficient or advanced on these writing tests uh, at grades eight and 12. Um, and then, we also see that many of them are testing basic or below basic, about 75% of all students. These figures are actually worse than the figures for, for reading, which are pretty bad. About a third of students test proficient or advanced in reading as compared to only about a quarter uh, in writing. Um, and for some student subgroups, these figures are even worse. I think for those students who qualify for free and reduced meals, so lower income students, the number below proficient, the percentage is about 87%. So obviously, whatever we've been doing to try to teach writing has not been working very well. So what have we been doing? Well, the traditional approach is to focus on grammar rules and, and sentence diagramming like this. Uh, and there are those who say that's what we need to go back to. Um, but the problem is that Oh, about 100 years worth of studies have shown that for most students, teaching grammar rules and this kind of sentence diagramming in the abstract does not carry over to their own writing. Sometimes it even has a negative effect. More recently, we've, a uh, very popular approach has arisen called Writer's Workshop. And that really, uh, tells students and teachers, don't worry too much about grammar rules, just develop voice and fluency and writing stamina. And it's mostly focused on personal narrative. So maybe write about a small moment, going to the beach, and then you, you really dig into the details of building a sandcastle. This is the approach associated with Lucy Calkins and her units of study. Um, and as many student, as many teachers may have discovered, you know, this a lot of students don't actually pick up writing conventions um, just through writing and, and through their own reading. Um, and so in reaction to uh, this kind of approach, the Common Core came along and introduced a different approach, uh, in especially in terms of genre expectations. 
the the authors of the Common Core wanted to get away from all of this personal narrative because they felt with some justification that it didn't really equip students for the kind of writing they would be expected to do in high school and beyond, which is more expository or persuasive or uh, argumentative writing. And so they changed the genre expectations to look like this. So even at grade four, students are expected to do much more um, persuasive and explanatory writing than they used to do. And, and generally that gets more and more emphasis as the grade levels go up. And that makes sense. But the thing about the Common Core is it doesn't really explain how to make this happen, how to teach this kind of writing. And in fact, you, as you may be aware, a lot of teachers don't get much training in how to teach writing at all. So the Common Core provided examples of what writing should look like. For example, in kindergarten, this is a, an, an exemplar of an opinion essay uh, by a kindergartner about my favorite book. That's supposed to be my favorite book. And then by eighth grade, the exemplar writing is supposed to look like this. Um, and I'm not even showing you what it's supposed to look like at 12th grade, but it's even more sophisticated than this. And again, there's no explanation of this is it's nice to know that this is what students are supposed to do, but the Common Core, of course, doesn't tell you how to make this happen. So um, one thing that all of these approaches to writing have overlooked is that writing is really hard. I'd say it's the hardest thing we ask students to do in school. Uh, why is it so hard? Well, again, it has to do with working memory. Remember, working memory can only hold a limited number of things for a limited period of time. And reading imposes a large, heavy burden on working memory because especially if you're dealing with decoding or if you're not fluent, you have to juggle a lot of those things in working memory and it's harder for you to understand what you're reading. But writing imposes an even greater burden. So inexperienced writers may be juggling letter formation, that's really more true at the lower end of elementary school, but spelling continues to be an issue. Word choice, uh, organization of one's thoughts. And then of course there's the content you're writing about. And so if you're an inexperienced writer, you can quickly get so overwhelmed that you don't have the cognitive capacity to either learn to write well or to think about the content you're writing about and get all of those knowledge building benefits that you could potentially get from writing. So all of this creates what cognitive scientists call cognitive load. Uh, that is the burden that is placed on working memory when you're juggling things in it. And open-ended or complex writing prompts can really be overwhelming for inexperienced writers. So I'm gonna show you just a couple. These happen to be from second grade, uh, but for inexperienced writers at any grade level, this could be overwhelming. So this one was a, a prompt that just asked students to write down everything they could remember that they'd learned about slavery over the past couple of days, which could be a great oral brainstorming activity. But when students are juggling, you know, how do I spell this or, you know, it, it can be overwhelming. And then there's also, this is a, an exit ticket, um, which the students were learning about the Civil War, but this uh, contains a fair amount of text for them to go through as obviously as second graders, that's not necessarily easy. And then this fairly broad question, what did Lincoln and the Union soldiers plan to do to end the war quickly? This, this can really be a difficult thing for struggling writers at any grade level to deal with. There's another thing these standard approaches overlook as well, which is that writing should be tied to the knowledge we want to build. It's, it can be very powerful for building knowledge thanks to that you know, dual effect of getting things into and then out of long-term memory. But in a lot of classes, in a lot of schools, the, there's a separate writing curriculum or a separate writing block or kids are just writing opinion essays about things that really they may know about from their personal experience. For example, this is one I just came across online, um, 60 persuasive writing prompts for middle school and high school. So convince your parents to raise your allowance, should at least two years of foreign language classes be required for high school graduation, et cetera. 
Now, students may have things to say about this, and, and they may be able to construct a good argument, although argumentative persuasive writing is really the hardest form, hardest genre to, to write. But even if they can do a good job with convincing their parents to raise their allowance, that's not necessarily going to carry over to writing about you know, the Civil War, say, if, if that's what they're learning about. So if students are learning about the Civil War, they should be writing about the Civil War. That's going to be more difficult because in addition to juggling the mechanics of writing, you're also having to deal with all of that relatively unfamiliar content. But it's also going to build your knowledge if you deal with that content, and that's what we want. So it's important to bear in mind, though, that writing can only build knowledge if the curriculum is focused on content, not comprehension skills and strategies like these. Um, and I, the elementary ELA curriculum is really dominated by this skills and strategies approach. I think that's less true in middle school, but it also, uh, in many middle schools, this is often the way instruction is organized. They might be, you know, let's focus on the skills. And the content is deemed to be less important. But if students are jumping from topic to topic because really what they're supposed to be learning is skill, and by the way, that doesn't actually work to boost reading comprehension, it also is not going to equip them to write even a few sentences about any one topic because they probably won't have enough information. So in order to exploit the potential power of writing, we and use it to engage students in writing and use it to build their analytical ability and academic knowledge and vocabulary. We need to have a curriculum that goes into depth in topics in social studies, science, and the arts. These are the subjects that have the most potential to build the kind of academic knowledge and vocabulary that students need to acquire yet more knowledge and also to boost their knowledge through writing. So how can we make writing easier and use it to build students' knowledge? Well, there are two basic principles that we need to observe. One is begin writing instruction at the sentence level to modulate cognitive load so that students are not overwhelmed by being asked to do too much at one time. And second, embed writing activities in the content of the core curriculum to build the kind of knowledge we want students to acquire. And there's only one method that I know of that combines both of these principles. And that is uh, laid out in this book called The Writing Revolution, of uh, which I am a co-author with Judith Hockman. And Judy Hockman is a veteran educator. This is her method that she developed over many years. Um, and uh, I've seen it in practice, and it really can work. Uh, it's also the name, the Writing Revolution is also the name of an organization that Judy founded to train teachers in the method. So I want to point out, I said begin at the sentence level to modulate cognitive load, not eliminate cognitive load. We don't want to eliminate cognitive load because not all cognitive load is bad. What's bad is excessive cognitive load and extraneous cognitive load that interferes with learning. So for example, if there's a diagram in a textbook, but the explanation of that diagram is on a different page, that's not helpful. We want uh, students to be able to devote their attention to what's actually going to help them learn. Uh, so some cognitive load is necessary for learning. Cognitive scientists have found there is no learning without some effort, without some load on working memory. So the, the goal then is to eliminate or reduce extraneous cognitive load, the kind that interferes with learning, and leave space for what is known as desirable difficult, good kind of cognitive load that promotes learning. So how does this apply to writing? Well. Um, one way it applies is that students need to engage in what cognitive scientists call deliberate practice. That helps embed writing skills in long-term memory. So just as if you have decoding skills embedded in long-term memory, you don't have to juggle them in working memory when you're reading. If you have certain writing skills in long-term memory, 
again, you don't have to juggle them. You have more cognitive capacity for higher order thinking. So how do we do that? Well, deliberate practice means giving students practice with manageable chunks of the process, then providing prompt targeted feedback. And when students have grasped one chunk, it's time to move on to another one that's harder. Um, so what chunk of writing, which is a very complex process, should we begin with? I'd say the sentence level. So why beginning writing instruction at the sentence level makes sense? Several reasons. One, sentences are the building blocks of all writing. If you can't write a good sentence, you're unlikely to be able to write a good paragraph or a good essay. Second, sentences make it easier to teach grammar in conventions. It's true that teaching grammar in the abstract doesn't work, but that doesn't mean we don't need to teach grammar at all. We do. And what does work is to teach it in the context of students' own writing. Um, and it's much easier to do that if you've got one or two sentences to deal with rather than page after page of error-filled writing. And lastly, of course, sentences free up space in working memory for those desirable difficulties. So what are, ki what are the kinds of sentence level skills that can be stored in long-term memory through this kind of practice? Well, the most basic is the concept of a sentence, like the difference between a complete sentence and a sentence fragment or a run-on sentence. And this is very basic, but it's something that even a lot of older students and adults have not been taught. Uh, and it doesn't work necessarily to say, oh, well, the definition of a sentence is a subject and a verb and it expresses a complete thought. That's too abstract. But practicing distinguishing complete sentences from ones that are not complete sentences or run on sentences, that does work, repeatedly doing that. Secondly, um, learning about different sentence types. You know, teachers may say, well, you need to vary your sentence structure. But if students don't know how to do that, that's not going to be enough. So teaching them, and this is, again, not something that all students pick up just by osmosis through their reading and their writing, it has to be explicitly taught for many, to many students. So what's a statement, what's a question, et cetera. And then teaching conjunctions, even simple conjunctions like because, but, and so, uh, and then getting into more complex sentences like using subordinating conjunctions like although, using a positives which are phrases that describe a noun, um, with these skills in long-term memory, then students are going to have more space in working memory to think about content and build their knowledge. But sentence level activities can also build knowledge while they are getting those skills into long-term memory. It has this dual effect. Not all sentence level activities, but many of them. So for example, uh, say you're teaching about the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. And by the way, this approach to writing instruction is not just for English class or ELA. It's really designed to be used in any subject and in any grade level. And social studies content is a, is a great medium for developing both writing skills and knowledge. So let's say you're teaching about the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. You can give students this activity that is known as because, but, and so, which is to give them a carefully constructed sentence stem that they need to finish with these those three different conjunctions. So for example, Abraham Lincoln was a great president because, but, and so. Each of these sentence stems is requiring students to retrieve information from long-term memory that they've slightly forgotten and then put it in their own words. And that's a really powerful way to build and deepen knowledge and to develop analytical abilities. And each of these conjunctions calls for a different kind of information, but is going to be more different, more difficult than because, because it calls for contrasting information. So is going to ask for cause and effect. Now, there are different ways students could complete these sentence stems, but here are some possibilities. Because he kept the North united during the Civil War, but many Americans didn't like him while he was alive. So more books have been written about him than any other American leader. 
So that's just a taste of what that can look like. Um, it can, as I mentioned, this method should be used across the curriculum, even in math, where it can be used to build knowledge. So let's say you're teaching about decimals and fractions. If you're a math teacher, you may not think you're a writing teacher, but you know, once math teachers see how effective this is at getting kids to really understand and remember math, uh, they generally really embrace it. So you could give them this sentence stem. Fractions are like decimals because they are all parts of wholes, but they are written differently. So they can be used interchangeably. So that's an idea of how this could be used in math. And then there's science. And here's a different activity um, in, in science. So sentence expansion. That means giving students a very bare bones, minimal sentence. They make good barriers. Obviously, they're going to need some knowledge of this topic uh, in order to begin here. But if they know what you're talking about and they have some knowledge, then they can fill in these three lines, what, where, and why. Lipids around cells, nonpolar. And then they can create their expanded sentence. Lipids make good barriers around cells because they are nonpolar. Again, building both sentence construction skills and knowledge at the same time. And again, social studies, this time with a positives. So suppose you're teaching about ancient Greece. You could give students a positives around which they need to build a complete sentence. So a Greek city-state, Athens, and they can tell you what they know about Athens, a great philosopher. They have to think of who is a great philosopher they've learned about, oh, Socrates. And what did he do? Created a method of questioning. So that, that's how this can work in that context. And then transition words. Again, these are all things that students are unlikely to know from spoken language, from conversation. These words like therefore, as a result, consequently, that the, they need explicit practice in using these. And at the same time, they'll be building their knowledge, in this case, about colonial times and the, and the American colonies and the American Revolution, Thomas Jefferson, et cetera. And then there are summary sentences. And this is in the context of uh, literature. So Johnny Tremaine. And again, there are these uh, question words that provide guidance, provide guardrails, prevent students from getting too overwhelmed uh, with all of the things they're trying to juggle in working memory. They've got these notes that provides a, a, a roadmap for constructing this sentence. And they begin the sentence, they're told according to this method, with the when part. Because that, again, is not something that we generally do in spoken language, but we often find that in written language to start with something like during the battle in Lexington. So I don't, I, I, I know that sometimes when I talk to uh, teachers at upper, upper grade levels beyond elementary school about these sentence level activities, they feel that these working on sentences is really just for kids. It's something you do in elementary school. And that's actually, nothing could be further from the truth. Constructing a sentence can be a very rigorous activity. It all depends on the content. It's not just for elementary students. So let's suppose I'm gonna give you a sentence stem about this guy, Immanuel Kant, who was an 18th century philosopher. Immanuel Kant believed that space and time are subjective forms of human sensibility, but obviously not for elementary school students. I cannot finish that sentence stem. Um, just an example of how uh, difficult it can be to complete a sentence stem. It all depends on the content. But I also don't want to leave you with uh, the impression that this method ends at the sentence level. It, it goes beyond that. Um, and sentences are the sort of the basis, but then it goes through outlines for both paragraphs and essays, uh, all the way through argumentative essays. And the cognitive load that writing imposes on students' working memories also doesn't go away. That continues beyond sentences as well. In fact, um, uh, writing at length, even if you 
are familiar with how to different ways of constructing sentences and different sentence level skills, I know as a writer that writing at length can impose a very heavy cognitive load. Um, so what can we do about that? Well, the best thing to do is to enable students to teach students how to construct an outline and a, a linear outline, not one of those bubble maps, because that doesn't tell you what you should do next. And it's very easy, even if with a single paragraph, if you're still an inexperienced writer, it's easy to lose your train of thought, to repeat yourself, to um, you know, go off track. If you've got an outline that tells you where to go, you don't have to juggle all of that in working memory. What was I gonna say next? Did I already say that, et cetera? So teaching students how to write a topic sentence and possibly uh, using a question, that in itself, by the way, is, is a very powerful knowledge building activity that also builds analytical ability. You know, we spend a lot of time with reading comprehension instruction, trying to get students to learn how to find the main idea. It doesn't really work when we do that, you know, in isolation from content, which is often what we do. It does work when it's when the content is in the foreground, and it really works when you have students not just doing this in terms of reading, but in terms of writing. It's harder, but it's more powerful. They really do have to find the main idea to construct a topic sentence, and that's something that can be explicitly taught through this kind of writing instruction. And then supporting details. One of the things this method helps students learn is how to take notes. Again, not all students just know how to do that. So it teaches them abbreviations it, and these dotted lines are an indication to students that this is not a place for a complete sentence. This is a place for their notes. So, and again, when they're writing these notes, they're having to retrieve information from long-term memory that they may have slightly forgotten and put it in their own words, process it. So this is an extremely powerful way of getting that, mem th that knowledge to really be sticky and also to be relatively easy to retrieve. And then a concluding sentence. And you know, some people say, this is so formulaic. The thing is when students are dealing with this really difficult task, writing, it's very helpful to have a formula when you're beginning, just like when you're beginning as a cook, it's really helpful to have a recipe. But then when you get more confident of your cooking skills, you can depart from the recipe and add your own little twists. Same with writing. Um, this is where students need to begin. And ultimately, if they, you know, they won't need to do this exactly this way. They won't need to have four supporting details or three or whatever. But this is really helpful to students who are trying to figure out where do I begin? And once they have this outline, now even just constructing this outline without turning it into a written paragraph is a powerful activity. And it can be done orally and collaboratively when students are first learning how to do this. It really helps build knowledge just to do the outline. But if they do have the sentence level skills to transfer this to a finished draft, then they have this roadmap and they can go right ahead and do that. And they can use their sentence level skills to make this writing flow. For example, you see the word however there, that's something they've learned. That's a transition word signifying a change of direction. So they can bring in those sentence level skills at this point to make their writing smooth and coherent. So to implement all of this effectively, I came up, this is my own invention, and uh, I don't know what Judy Hockman would think of this, but it just occurred to me. You know, I think that sometimes uh, it can be hard for teachers, this is kind of all unfamiliar, and, and teachers may be used to having a separate writing block uh, that, that's not something that's integrated into the curriculum. So maybe to help teachers remember how to implement this effectively. I came up with this idea of the three I's. So the first I is introduce new writing strategies orally, collaboratively, and in a familiar context. And again, this is 
because we want to modulate cognitive load, when a, let's say it's an appositive, right? Uh, when it's unfamiliar and kids are trying to juggle in working memory now, what is an appositive? How do you use it? They'll have more cognitive capacity for that if they're not also trying to write at the same time. And if they're doing it as a group, that will be helpful as well. It's also going to be helpful if the, the material that they're writing about is something that's familiar to them. So they don't have to also be juggling new information. So it could be, you know, a holiday, um, let's say Halloween, um, a much loved holiday in October is a time when children dress in costumes and go trick or treating. So, you know, it could be very familiar from life experience like holidays, or it could be some academic material that you know students really are familiar with and 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 that will you know act as a way of reminding them of that material and helping to build their knowledge even more so that's the first eye the second eye integrate writing activities with instruction so rather than a separate writing block again um this is a th this approach really should be seen as a way of teaching, not just as a way of teaching writing. So these sentence level activities could be do nows. Um, they could be quick reviews or basis for discussion, quick comprehension checks, exit tickets, or doing uh, a, the outline of a paragraph or uh, even a longer piece of writing could be an oral group activity that really helps students think about this content. Um, and, and they're not having to do it necessarily on their own. Or you could pause and say, okay, now I want everybody to try outlining a paragraph about all these things we've just been discussing, but it would relate to the content you've been discussing, the content of the curriculum. And then the third eye is to interleave different strategies that have been covered. So that interleave, that is a term that's used by cognitive scientists. Interleaving has been to, found to be a very powerful form of basically retrieval practice. And what it means is mixing things up. So uh, varying what you're asking students to do. In math, it could be, you know, not just one kind of math operation, and then we move on to another. But, you know, we learned about long division last month. Let's bring that back in now and hear a couple of problems on that. With writing, it could be, well, we learned about a positives last month, but now let's, let's do an activity about this new content using an appositive. And that both helps students think about whatever this new content is, it also helps them remember uh, how to use an appositive uh, and, and makes it more likely they're going to be able to remember that when you say, why don't you vary your sentence structure? How about, you know, maybe in a positive, it makes it more likely that they'll think of doing that themselves. So this may help you remember, um, you know, how to, how to integrate this, how to introduce these things, integrate them, and then mix them up a bit to make this really effective. So this is a, an individual student that I, I just wanted to uh, give you as an example. This was a, a ninth grader named Danny um, at, a, at a high school uh, in New York called Newdorp, which this was a few years ago now, but uh, they adopted this, wasn't called the writing revolution yet, it was called the Hockman method. Um, they adopted it mostly in social studies, but eventually across the curriculum. And at the beginning of the year, this ninth grader, Danny, was given this writing prompt, explain why we study the past. And as you can see, this is not very well sort of put together, not a smooth piece of writing. Um, and, you know, he obviously was a struggling writer. Later that year, after having been exposed to the writing revolution, method. He was able to complete on his own this outline for not just a paragraph, but an argumentative essay on the conquest of the Americas. And, and he has at the top his thesis statement. While some view the conquest of the Americas as a positive event, without question, it had a negative impact. And you can see he's outlined his paragraphs here. TS stands for uh, 
topic sentence. Um, so he's really, you know, he's got this roadmap and he knows where he's going and he can use this to construct an essay that looks like this. Throughout history, there have been many controversies, et cetera. And here is that thesis statement, which becomes, and this is another thing that is taught, the thesis statement becomes the last sentence of your introductory paragraph. So this is the kind of transformation that writing instruction can have when it's done in a way that enables all students to benefit from it, and not ju just those who are lucky enough to pick it up. So just to sum up, and then I'll be happy to take questions, um, writing has the power to uh, enable students to build their skills and knowledge in all subjects and grades. But to unleash that power, we need to modulate the cognitive load that writing imposes. We need to make sure that students aren't being overburdened, their working memory is not being overburdened by extraneous things that are gonna just impede learning and that they have the cognitive capacity and working memory to think about what they're writing about and to acquire new knowledge and new writing skills. To ensure writing is building knowledge, we need to have students write about the content of the curriculum and that curriculum needs to have rich content in it and spend you know, at least two or three weeks on a topic um, so that students have the opportunity to acquire information vocabulary that they can use as grist for the, the mill of their writing. And lastly, effective writing instruction can boost students' confidence and change their concept of who they are and what they can accomplish. And this is something that teachers have told me that I've seen, um, you know, that first of all, it writing, it's not just about it, writing skill, important as that is, it boosts their reading comprehension, it, it enhances their speaking ability, uh, boosts their analytical abilities, and it's a tremendous confidence builder. Um, it makes students feel they can tackle some really difficult things and they'll be okay. So I'm gonna stop there um, and uh, be happy to take questions if people have them. Thanks, Natalie, that's terrific. And we do have some great questions coming in. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please look for the Q&A button at the bottom center of your screen and we will answer as many as we have time for. Natalie, first, a very fundamental question about the writing revolution. What grade levels and skills does the writing revolution work for? Well, the subtitle of the book is um, Advancing Thinking Through Writing in All Subjects and Grades. And um, I think that's true. I, you know, it can be adapted for young children, kindergartners even. Um, I, I, the recommendation at that grade level is to do things orally and collaboratively, but you can even do outlining a paragraph with, with kindergartners. I happened to walk into a kindergarten class where the teacher was leading the kids through outlining a paragraph about what a great toy Play-Doh is and why, uh, but it could also be embedded in kindergarten content. Um, so, Again, the rigor of this is going to uh, change with the content. And um, it, it really can be adapted to any grade level. I'd say the one limitation is college, unfortunately, even though there are a lot of college instructors who would love to be able to use this, but you, you, know, you, you really at that level, especially it needs to be implemented across the curriculum for it to work. And, very hard to get college professors to do what you tell them to do. <laughs> so, um, so that's an obstacle there. But at any other grade level, it can really be effective. That's really powerful. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions drilling down on kind of the concept of deliberate practice and the ability to build up from the sentence level. It seems like that's really very doable to weave in whatever your curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, and, and about deliberate practice, um, you know, there are different kinds of knowledge. There's sort of knowing that and knowing how. And writing combines 
both of those things. So that's one reason it's really difficult. But the these skills like knowing that how to construct a complex sentence, that is procedural knowledge. That is a sort of knowing how kind of knowledge. And that's the kind of knowledge for which you need repeated targeted practice to get it to become pretty much automatic. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I think it were, it's, it's true for all sorts of things. You know, there's that Macklin Gladwell book about the 10,000 hours of practice. That's, this is what he was talking about. Um, it's not just practice, 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 because if you just do the same wrong thing over and over again, that's probably going to be a bad thing, right? That's going to reinforce some some bad habits. So it really it has to be a little more controlled than that. But that's the the base, same basic idea. And if I heard you correctly, then practicing at that sentence level gradually builds up some stamina that you can continue to apply to longer and longer writing. Is that right? Yeah, I would say that that's part of it. Um, but I think we've seen stamina as just like getting kids to write at length. We have basically put a priority on length. And that uh, when kids don't have those basic sentence level skills under their belt, you know, that's not going to really be effective. They may be able to sit there for half an hour and write something, but will anybody be able to understand it when they're done? So it's a combination of stamina and acquiring these skills in a very uh, systematic way. Excellent. And a new question, is it feasible to think that teachers can be masters of teaching both reading and writing? They're connected, but both are so complex, it can feel a little overwhelming. You know, one thing after spending the last several years observing teachers and thinking about teaching, I mean, teaching is just incredibly complex. It's almost, you almost, it's almost a superhuman task. Unfortunately, I would say yes, teachers do actually, and not just English teachers. I think all teachers need to consider themselves teachers of content as well as reading and writing because reading and writing are that difficult that students need a lot of reinforcement, a lot of deliberate practice, across the curriculum to become good readers and writers. Um, and I think, you know, uh, what we really need is better training for teachers in how to teach these things for, you know, for all teachers. Uh, but I do think, you know, I don't want to make it sound like this is an impossible task. It takes a while to get used to this method, this approach to writing instruction. But teachers have told me that once they get it under their belt, then it it actually makes teaching easier because the kids you can you know they're learning better as a result of this and it becomes easier once you get used to the idea easier to integrate this into your classroom routine that's great and then some questions about maybe putting the method into practice for a teacher who's wanting to do more writing in the fall. How long would you say it takes to train students in this method? First six weeks of school, more or less? I, it's hard to answer that. I would say definitely not just the first six weeks of school. I would recommend taking a look at the book. Beyond that, if you really, I mean, I think some teachers can read the book and they're like, okay, I'm good to go. But I think for many teachers, the book is a great starting point, but the Writing Revolution organization also offers online courses. Um, and that I think, I mean, I, I'm told, I, I've taken the course, but I, you know, I'm not a teacher, but teachers have told me it's really, really helpful. And it's not, unfortunately, like there's a, a definitive answer for any group of students is gonna take six weeks to do X, Y. There is a scope and sequence included at the back of the book. But students are going to vary. Students in one classroom are not all going to be, of course, at the same level of ability. They're not all going to pick up these things at the same rate. But what's great about this method, this approach, is that it does enable teachers to differentiate, not the content, the content should stay the same, but to differentiate how students interact with the content. So for example, one student, let's say it's the Civil War, which I keep bringing up, but let's say it's something about the Civil War. One student could be writing an essay 
another could be writing a paragraph, and another student could be writing one, two, or three sentences or sentence stems, completing those sentence stems. All of those students are grappling with the same content and, and possibly in a, you know, even at, at the sentence level in quite a rigorous way if those sentence stems are well constructed, but none of them are being overwhelmed and they're all being challenged. Makes a lot of sense. I'm glad you mentioned the scope and sequence in the writing revolution because we did get a question about that. And just to clarify, the writing revolution is a lot more than only research, right? There's practice and prompts and recommendations in there oh, as well. Yeah. And in fact, I mean, it's it's the subtitle is a guide to advancing thinking through writing. It is written very much for practicing teachers. And there are examples at different, we didn't label them as grade levels because we know there are a lot of high school students who still are not have not been taught how to construct a good sentence so we we did like level one level two level there might be a level three um depending on where your students are um so you know i again i'm, I'm not necessarily going to completely equip you to put this into practice but it is a very practical book in terms of examples and, and explanations Excellent. And then I'm just going to pause and pivot to another area where we're getting a lot of questions about collaborating with the content area teachers and teaching writing across all the disciplines and getting the buy in from the content area teachers. Anything you can share with us on that? Well, that really just takes some support from the administration. Um, you know, one thing that Judy Hockman has told me is it's really essential for teachers to have common planning time um, and to be using a common vocabulary. So if the English teacher is talking about a positives, then the social studies teacher would be great if that, if he or she too is talking about a positives. And ditto for the science teacher and the Spanish teacher, and even in some schools, the PE teacher, you know, um, it, it, and certainly, especially in science and math, the, are teachers who've said, well, I'm not a writing teacher, you know, <laughs> I'm a science teacher, I'm a math teacher. But as I said, I think um, once they try it and they see that this is not a hindrance to their teaching, it's actually a boost to their teaching, um, they usually get on board and become very enthusiastic. But an individual teacher, I'd say, try this out in your classroom uh, as an individual teacher and see what you think. But to really, uh, you know, unleash the power of this method, uh, you're gonna need some help from the administration to get it implemented across the curriculum. And a related question, thank you, about how a co-teacher, like an English langu language learners teacher in a gen ed class, how you can convince gen ed teachers that teaching writing explicitly is so important, how you can kind of spread the revolution. Well, I mean, they, they definitely, um, you know, should be able to see it if they try it. Th this method was actually uh, developed with for kids with language based learning disabilities. And, and you know, it, initially, that was the community that was using this, uh, but it spread and it spread even to elite private schools where the kids were not learning, they were not all learning how to write. Uh, what, you know, the, what happened was a kid who you know, had been diagnosed with a learning disability at an elite private school might go to this other private school where Judy Hoffman was working for a couple of years. That was the idea is that this private school for kids with learning disabilities would take them for a couple of years and then they'd go back to the school they came from. And when they went back to their regular elite private school, the teachers were astonished to find suddenly this kid was their best writer. So that's how it began to spread. Um, it works great with English language learners. As it works great with kids who are really struggling with writing, but it also works wonders with all kids at any level of ability. Um, and how to convince them, you know, I, I wish I had some magic words that you could say, but I think just talking about it, explaining it, and maybe showing them the results that you're able to achieve with the kids that you're teaching is the way to do it. That's great, thank you. Just a couple more questions, if you don't mind. Sure. As either a teacher or a parent looking for more activities like because, but, and so, 
Are there resources you recommend? Are there workbooks or other sets of prompts that you recommend? There aren't workbooks, but um, as I said, there are um, quite a few examples in the book. And uh, if you if you buy the book, then you get access. In fact, maybe during the pandemic, I know they opened this. The Writing Revolution organization opened this to everyone. There are resources online um, through the Writing Revolution organization templates uh, that you know will show you uh, embedded in different content. Uh, you know, here's how you can teach an a positive. Here's how you can teach sentence expansion using this worksheet. Uh, and of course, you can adapt it to other content as well. But that's that's an additional sort of guide to how to really put this into practice. Nice. And then one really granular question. In my experience, students are having great difficulty taking ideas from outlines and putting them into sentences and then paragraphs, any specific strategies you might recommend? Yes, I mean, this is, you know, one of the trickier things is getting students to, tra if they may have practiced those sentence level skills, but then actually getting them to use them in their own independent writing is, is often, you know, a bit of a, a struggle. What Judy Hockman recommends is uh, something called the unelaborated paragraph. So I, I showed you that sentence expansion activity with a very bare bones, uh, simple sentence that students then had to expand into something richer with more content. You can do the same kind of thing with a paragraph that can, and again, this needs to be embedded in content that students are familiar with but you give them a very bare bones paragraph and ask them to expand it. And you can give them hints like using a positive here, you know, use a subordinated conjunction here. Um, and if you get them to do that repeatedly, that should uh, help them learn to start using those sentence level skills in their own writing. Fantastic. One final question. A couple of folks have asked if you could just show that last slide again and maybe oh. walk us through it one more time. Sure. And while you're doing that, I wanna thank everybody for joining us and remind you that we'll get an email out to you tomorrow afternoon, including a link to this full recording and some additional excerpt, an excerpt from the Writing Revolution and some additional links that Natalie has mentioned. Thank you. So uh, this is that last slide that uh, mm -hmm. writing has the power to, and I'm, I'm, unfortunately on my screen, part of this is obscured, but you guys, I assume, can see it, uh, but to help students build their skills and knowledge in all subjects and grades. To unleash that power, we need to modulate the cognitive load that writing imposes so that that good kind of cognitive load can boost the learning process. To ensure writing is building knowledge, we need to have students write about the content of the curriculum. And effective writing instruction can boost students' confidence and change their concept of who they are and what they can accomplish. So wonderful. Got what a that. wonderful way to sum it up. What a wonderful aspiration. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. And thank you, Natalie, for sharing your wisdom today. Oh, well, thank you. It was my pleasure.